I won't keep you too long for lunch. Um, as mentioned, do my bit for the conference. Go and rate the previous sessions, because some of them have been incredible so far. So to start with, um, I'm Matt. I'm a developer. I do work at a cybersecurity company that is currently building a set of tools and platforms to educate a new generation of cybersecurity professionals in the UK. I'm a mentor and mentee. I like teaching and learning from those around me to help improve the ecosystem and the, the areas in which we work. I like tinkering, be that with code or how I can best optimize the temperature of my gecko tanks or my chickens, that kind of thing. We'll start with the kind of typical who are hackers. They range in personality type, age, background, experience, um, skill set. They don't follow any kind of typical, you know, you look at someone and that is a hacker. The movies will have you believe otherwise. There's a hood, black screen, lots of green flashing text past their face, but in reality, it's not like that. We'll start with the kind of basic definition that a lot of people go to. This is very simplified. This is not a nuanced discussion on each of the different types. But you have black hack, hack Black, black hat hackers, hacker doing evil. White hat, hacker doing good. Gray hat, hacker hacking. Top hat, hacker doing fancy stuff. Um, ultimately, there's a lot of crossover in the types of people there, but that's a whole separate talk in and of itself. <clears throat> the main thing that kind of I've seen in the younger generations that we're trying to teach as well is there's three kind of main areas that we've been looking at, and that's that they are incredibly clever, very creative, and some of the most curious people I have met. Now, curiosity is the biggest common trait that we're mainly going to be focusing on here. It's that constant looking at, what happens if I press this button? What happens if I just tinker with that bit over there? Oh, that value is interesting. What happens if I change that? How does the system respond? And using that back and forth with the system, they can then probe a little bit further and start to gauge what's going on behind the scenes. <coughs> So with that curious nature combined with a creative approach and very clever um, solutions, that can lead to a really interesting way of actually thinking about how someone might try and get into your systems. There's a number of reasons why they might do it. For us, we're trying to sort of educate a new generation of people to grow up and you know, consider this as a career path. There's a huge lack of cybersecurity professionals in a world that is just getting worse and worse with the breaches and the bad code being put out there. So we're trying to teach a new generation of people, you know, here's the things you need to start considering if you go into InfoSec or if you go into a development career. It's nice to have that background knowledge to know what the sort of, the sort of things I need to be looking into. They might do it for financial gain. There's a, you know, sticks and ransomware on a system, just wait for the Bitcoin to roll in. It's not always to steal data, though. It's, you know, there's a whole other, other range of reasons why they might do it. To, for their reputation, they might do it because you know, they want the bragging rights. It might be corporate reasons, and that's not even necessarily one company attacking another. It could be they work for a company where they are hired by an organization to test their security. An organization will speak to them and say, you know, we want you to do a report, report, see what kind of exploits, what kind of vulnerabilities we have in our systems. Come back to us at the end, and you know, we can work on fixing them. Ideological reasons could be another one. You might have a different political or social, religious idea to, to someone else. They might disagree with that and see that as a reason to come after you. One of the big ones was in the US, the Westboro Baptist Church were going to be protesting the funeral of a school attack. Anonymous decided they didn't like that. They brought down their website, defaced it. It could also be that you've just stumbled upon something. With this curious nature that sort of underpins all of this, it could just be you've got an order from a website and you've got the order details come through and you've noticed there's some interesting things in the URL. You just start poking around or you know, form submissions. You just oh, want to see what happens if I do this, and then you stumble upon something that leads you somewhere further. So we've got to consider as well what makes you a target. Now, there's a whole bunch of reasons why you might be a target. You could be popular. If you're big and popular, that's good for their reputation. If they want that, you've probably got a large set of data behind the scenes that might be valuable to someone. Again, politics and your perspective might be a reason why you're a target. The people in your organization might be a target, and that's not even necessarily with malicious intent. Ex-employees might be um, you know, disgruntled at the way they left the company, for example. Or it could even be that you've just opened up a vulnerability into your systems without even realizing it. In the US, about five years ago, there was a case 
a company noticed a large portion of traffic over their BPM coming from China. They looked into it, did a security audit on it, and realized that one of their employees had given his company VPN credentials to a company in China because he was outsourcing his job while he spent the whole day browsing Reddit and eBay. So that's not even necessarily a malicious, I want to get someone in to do damage. That's just, I've now opened up my com company's VPN to an external party. And it could be potluck. You could just be a target because there's some automated scanner out there that found something on a vulnerable package in one of your applications. So we need to look at start reducing the risk of these things. There is no magic solution. There is no one-click install security. A lot of systems have one-click installs for various platforms, but there's no magic do this and everything works. There's no magic solution. You need to embed your security considerations into your whole project. Now, that means at the spec level, at the implementation discussions, you need to include security tests as part of the ongoing development, as well as potentially in your CI pipeline and your automated checks. And the big one that I found as well is ensuring security considerations are a part of your acceptance criteria. When you're writing tests for your system, don't just consider what's the happy path. If you're logged in as user A and you try and access details for user B, what should happen? You've got to consider those sorts of things. If you only ever test the happy path, you're never pushing the limits of, well, actually, what happens if someone does try, does try doing things in the way that we haven't expected? And you kind of need to consider this for the whole project, because ultimately, <laughs> no one has the time or money for securing their systems until it's too late. You know, you get hacked, and then suddenly, the managers are like, oh, we've got all the money and time in the world for you to fix this, because our reputation has been damaged, and we're now in damage control. But they never had the time or the money for it before. It's only once it goes public that everyone goes, oh shit, something's gone wrong, we need to fix this. But you kind of need to consider it at a way sooner level, because by the time it's got out there and deployed, it's too late. And because of that, it's every developer's responsibility as well to do these things. This talks about sort of thinking like a hacker, but it's also looking at the, the mistakes that developers are making that allow attackers into systems. It's kind of all of our responsibility to make sure that we make sure that it's pushed at every level of the project as well. Everyone here has the chance to go back to their teams, and when you get, when you get the spec for your next piece of work, the next feature you're building, just ask a few questions. What happens if something else happens? You know, what, what happens if I were this user and I tried to do this thing? What should the case be? Should the system completely fail? Should I display an error message? What kind of things am I looking to do? So because of that, we kind of enter a people problem in technology. In any system, it's often said by a lot of people, you know, people are the weakest part of the system. It's kind of, the movies would have you believe that, you know, the laptop's encrypted, they need to build a supercomputer to crack it. In reality, they'll drug him and hit him with a wrench until he tells them the password. It's the people behind the systems that are the weakness. You need to consider things like the principle of least privilege, which is where don't give your developers access to everything all of the time. You don't need it. You've got to consider what's the minimum amount of access you need in order to do your job. That's not limiting everything and not giving you access to anything. You still need to be able to do your job. But you don't need everything all of the time. Limit who has access to what. For example, do your devs really need 24-7 access to a production database? Who here could pull out their laptop right now and log into production with no real effort? Why? Why do you need that? I mean, yes, it's useful. Sometimes you need to go and look into production database. What's gone wrong? There is debugging that needs to be done. But you shouldn't have access to a permanent login. Or any real credentials. You don't need those. There's ways to manage this that aren't that. You could do things like have a break glass button, have a system in place, you know, Git ops and chat ops, and you know, Slack ops, as it's <laughs> becoming known, because we all use Slack. Slash Slack, give me you know, access to production write a command that does it, you get a temporary login for production for an hour. It's logged, everyone knows about it. You've now got a very restricted access to do your job, but it's not just completely unmetered, unlimited access to production where you can go and do whatever you want. These are the sorts of things that can be done. You can audit it as well by providing, you know, even if it's something you do quite regularly, make an admin interface in your system where it's controlled as to what you do. You're not just going into the database and changing things. Disposable credentials can be generated by a centralized system. Again, you can audit it, log it, and then if you do have any problems at a given point in time, you've got a way to trace back to what was the thing that caused that 
those credentials to be given. So then you look at things like, well, where is your data stored? If you can get access to this data, where might it be stored? It could be a web app that you've got online somewhere. Reality, most software talks to some web-based back-end platform these days. There are still you know, embedded desktop applications that are very self-contained, but for the most part, everything talks to the web, so we're going to be kind of focusing on a lot of that side of things. So the web app is running on a server. Is there data stored there? Do you have any connected data stores? Do you have databases, caches, file systems that you might talk to? S3 is a massive place for storing files. What about where your code is stored? Do you put it on GitHub? Do you put it on Bitbucket? Do you put it on GitLab? Again, these places where it's not just necessarily just your data data, it's your code. That's a part of the data that your company has. And you're sitting there going, well, you know, it's fine. We've got our databases in production. And really, Matt, I'm not leaving it exposed, because no one would be silly enough to leave databases online and exposed to the public. That would be a really, really silly thing to do. But in reality, a lot of systems are out there, exposed. Software platforms are getting better to put these restrictions in place. But for example, a lot of old MongoDB servers are out there. They didn't have authentication enabled by default. So they're out there online, spewing out data for anyone who knows how to get to it to get it. So these are also people that are third parties that you're trusting with your data. <clears throat> it's not just you running your own infrastructure. So you use Slack, maybe. Google Docs for kind of planning of things, host your code on AWS, use Jira for project management. So even if it's not necessarily the data they're going for, it's things like, what trust levels have you got with those other companies? Do you trust them to just do whatever they want because you've given them access to your data? Maybe so. But it's kind of not necessarily always third parties, it's just who do you trust with that data? For example, Trello, Who's heard of Trello, project management software? Used by a lot of organizations to plan projects, put notes out online. There's a lot of Trello boards out there that are public that have credentials stored in them in cards. You know, oh, here's the emails that the email access that such and such needs to get into this system, and the boards are public that you can search through on Google. It's then looking at, well, if you're trusting these with your data, it's not even necessarily their fault when things go wrong, it's how you're using them. So then it's not only just your data, it's who are the third parties you trust with your customer data. This got even more interesting with GDPR that came in. It's now a case of, well, if there is a data breach, you have a very limited amount of time to report it, so you need to know about it. And then you have to make sure that you inform your customers that this has taken place, and you take the appropriate steps to make sure it doesn't happen again. Again, after the fact, everyone's got the time and money for it, but that's too late. It's not to say it won't happen, but you can definitely reduce the risk if you start considering it from the, from the get-go. So you end up with this kind of web of trust where you're in the middle and you've got all these connected third parties that have got access to your systems, and they've got access to systems that might also be now able to interact with your website, whatever it might be. One of the big examples was um, last year when the crypto miners came in in JavaScript world, where a lot of UK websites were pulling in an accessibility package to allow screen readers to operate on the website. That package was also pulling in some stuff. It got compromised. Suddenly, there's uh, JavaScript, in this case, was running crypto miners to try and make money for the attackers. But they've now got JavaScript that they can execute on your site just because you've trusted someone, and they've trusted someone. Now it's not even a direct connection. You've really got to consider, OK, when you bring in someone to give them access to your data, be that a JavaScript package in a front end to do whatever, or a back end uh, project dependency that does something else. There's a whole web of trust that goes a lot further than you might think. So the big one for things like knowing where to look, it's all about when we're teaching the kids, it's all about you know what, what the, that curiosity again, where might you find this sort of data? One of the big search engines used for things like the Internet of Things, but can also just return information on any connected device on the internet that it deems worthy is something called Shodan. It's a search engine that lets users find specific types of computers using various queries. There's a whole bunch of filters and whatnot. The public version is you need an account to do some of the more advanced stuff. But you can go on there, type MongoDB server, and it will tell you all the MongoDB servers it's found on the internet. A lot of them will be protected. Some of them might not. 
Which then leads us into, well, if you're, you've got this data, why have you got it? If you don't have it, you can't lose it. So if you don't have it, you're reducing your risk again. Do you really need that particular piece of data? Again, GDPR helped with this because it's reducing, hopefully, <laughs> the amount of data that companies are collecting. In reality, every company is hiding behind the legitimate business interest excuse and storing whatever they want. Hopefully, that's going to get better. Google was fined under the new laws. They were using some personal data for um, processing it for advertising use, and they were deemed not to have permission to do that. So if Google can be fined for it, hopefully other companies that are doing the same thing can also be fined. One of the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities is sensitive data exposure. The problem with that is it can happen, but if you don't have the data, you can't expose it. So the first step is questioning. Well, why do we have that data? What's it being used for? If it's because we need it, well, then ask, why do we need it? What are we doing with it? If you don't really need it, don't store it. It's a whole level of liability that you then reduce. And if you don't have it, you can't give it to questionable third parties who want to do nefarious things with the data either. So if you do end up having to store this data, you want to encrypt it in transit and at rest. So that means you HTTPS all the things for transfer between systems. If you've got APIs that are talking to each other, Let's Encrypt makes certificate generation really easy these days. Just go with something like that. You don't even have to pay for it anymore. It's incredibly reliable. It's free. It's used by more and more sites every day. There's really no excuse in 2019 to not be doing this sort of thing. It's not even a cost thing anymore. It's just how it should be. Browsers are getting rid of the little secure icon to say, you know, this website's secure. And they're now saying, if you don't have it, it's not secure. So it's just kind of now becoming a standard. So we've then got to consider, OK, if we do have this data in these third parties, again, we go back to, like, well, where are our repos stored? We've got repositories that hold our code. Potentially, they know, the code knows how to configure itself in order to run on whatever servers that you, um, you run it on. Surprisingly enough, there's a lot of places where secrets end up in repos. It's Again, 2019, and it still happens. People commit their secrets into a repository. And OK, if your repository is private on GitHub, no one else has access to it. But how long until GitHub has some sort of hiccup where private repositories become public for a brief period, and now everyone can pull your Git history? So this is an area where people don't generally consider to look for things like secrets. It's a case of, well, if you've got a secret in your repo, you know, just make a new commit, get rid of it but you haven't gone back through the history, removed it from the history of the repo, it's still there. One of my favorite examples was actually a really silly, simple one on Reddit. Someone had posted a website that they'd made, and in the repository, they'd left the FTP details for their website. So someone logged in, changed the homepage to say, change your password, and gave them instructions on how to remove it from Git and everything else. This person then posted a follow-up comment on Reddit saying, cool, thank you very much, I fixed it now. Um, about 10 minutes later, the site updated to say, no, you haven't. Because the person had removed it from Git and then recommitted and left the password in the history and not changed it. <coughs> These sorts of things end up in repositories and then get forgotten about. There are tools to help with this. One of them is GitLeaks, which is a project that will search through your Git repositories and tell you if it finds any potential secrets within it. So it's a really useful tool to just run on your repository just to make sure you haven't made a mistake. These are the things that people capitalize on, is the mistakes that people make. But then you've also got things like checking your public sites for secrets. I'm primarily a PHP developer. And in the PHP world, there's a framework that recommends using env files for managing your environment variables in a local development setup. So you can load environment variables, and it will have this file that stores them. It doesn't recommend using it for production, but people make mistakes. Therefore, these things get into production. It's a really surprising thing to run a Google search for .env files on websites and see all the public ones that list their database credentials, their Stripe credentials, their Mailgun credentials, all of the things that you might need to send data on their behalf or access their backends. It's really not something that people consider. But again, this goes back to, are you committing those secrets into your repository? If you are, then when you're deploying, you might be deploying those secrets out in an incorrect way as well. 
So you need to check your public sites for secrets. I'm not going to go too much into detail with it, but there's a thing called a Google Doc query that gives you the ability to find these sorts of things. Um, you know, what sort of things do I need to search for to be able to look at that? I would recommend not doing this on anyone else's website. It's only your own stuff, because you should not do anything without written permission. So we go back to this idea of curiosity. What if? What if, what if, what if? What if I change this value? What if I try a negative number in the quantity of product? Will the website fail and pay me instead? What if I see what's in this directory? I can see a file path in the URL. What if I traverse back and see what I can get? This is the kind of curiosity that drives the leaking of information, which ultimately boils down to don't trust user input. It's a thing that still needs to be said in this day and age is that everything we do, we shouldn't trust what the users are entering because even if it's not malicious, it could go wrong. I had, it's not even malicious web people on malicious websites or websites that might have anything hugely valuable. But again, because you've got a website or you're a web app, there's probably data behind it that might be valuable. I once got a message from a recruiter that I'd used in the past saying, you know, hey, here's, you know, we might be looking for some new positions. Some of these came up, you might be interested. They didn't have an unsubscribe link in their email, which was naughty of them. So I looked, and there was a form on their website to remove yourself from their mailing lists and their systems. Cool, brilliant. As you know, I'd like to be removed from the mailing list, please. At which point, the website spat back an SQL error at me and the file path of it and the trace of everything that had gone on. Anyone want to take a guess at what caused the issue? They weren't escaping. They weren't preparing. They weren't doing anything to sanitize the input that I was sending to their database which could have been disastrous. I didn't do anything with this. I just sent them an email back to the person I had and said, you know, actually, this needs to be fixed. Six months later, it wasn't fixed because I got another email and tried the same thing to see what happens. Again, curiosity. What happens if I just do that again? So <laughs> it seems odd to have to say this again in 2019, but using prepared statements if you are talking to a database is an absolutely fundamental thing. It's 2019. Injection is still the top, well, in the 2017 OWASP top 10 report, injection was the number one vulnerability. It, it shouldn't be a thing. The idea behind prepared statements is very simple. You don't just put a string that was given to you from the front end into a database query. You use placeholders. You send the query and the executed parameters to the server in separate statements. Most languages have a way to do this. It's very simple to do. So now we get into it's not even just trusting user data. It's don't trust data. User data might not necessarily come from a form on your website. You think, oh, I just won't trust that input. I'll filter all my inputs. But there was a really fun example of someone put in a TXT record of their website the embed code for Rick Astley is never going to give you up. And then when you did a Whois search on a particular website, it pulled the TXT records, popped up the video, and played it in your browser for you. Now, ultimately, yes, it's come from a user. They've entered the TXT record. But this website was just blindly trusting the data that it, it had pulled from a third party. So it's not even just about tr don't trust user data. Don't trust any data that's got a way to get into your system. Here's another one that we've seen a lot is client-side validation, which is nice because you get instant feedback on the user entering data into their fields. But you have to back it up with the same validation on the back end as well. The problem is that if you just trust that, oh, any requests coming to my server, they must have come from my client, be it a mobile app, um, some sort of Internet of Thing device that's sending requests, um, even a website. There are ways to be able to view that traffic as a user. If I submit a request to a website, I can run it through a very simple proxy that will show me the data that's being sent, which means that I've got this client that's doing validation. I'm sending the data to the back end. I can sit and observe what that data going being sent to the back end is, which then means that if I know what data is being sent, I can manipulate it to just send my own payload. And if the validation is only being done on the client side and the back end is just trusting that the data comes from a trusted place, well, am I a trusted place if I've just sent the data to the back end? Probably not. But these are the sorts of things that you kind of look at something, you send it, and you go, OK, what happens if I observe what's going on? Just try and put my own set of data in. One of the examples of this is broken access control, which is sort of the 
It's called Insecure Direct Object References in the OWASP Top 10. It's been merged with a couple of different things, but it's, again, you don't trust user input. Just because, for example, you know the order number of an order doesn't mean you should be able to access that order. We've all bought from a website before where we've seen this sort of thing. You know, order equal, uh, equals one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, what happens if I decide that I don't like that? Do I, do I trust this as a back-end developer? Do I just trust that if the ID is given to me, it should be able to be viewed? What happens when that gets changed to one, two, three, four, five, seven? Do I see another order? If one, two, three, four, five, six was for user A, and I'm logged in as user B, I shouldn't be able to view it. But too often, these sorts of things happen where they just trust it. If you've got the order number, just give them the details. These are the sorts of things that, with this broken access control, just don't get thought about. So ensuring you have this sort of correct access control, um, you might look into something like role-based access control or attribute-based access control. Those are topics that warrant talks in and of themselves because they are extensive very fundamental level, you kind of look at something like an order and you kind of request, can this user, the user I'm signed in as or a guest of the website, can this user do this thing to this thing? So can this user view this order? And then there you'll have some checks to say, well, actually, no, the user ID doesn't match the user of the order, so no, they're not allowed to. You might have an admin system where the admins can view orders. So you say, well, the user ID doesn't match, but they are an admin, so yeah, they can do. Which then kind of leads us into, it's not even necessarily trusting the user's input, which it is, but you just don't trust users. They're the worst people of websites. It's unfortunate, because we kind of need them, but you can't trust them. Um, a non-website-based example of this was, my company went to a company get-together, and we were doing escape rooms. And we got into one of the escape rooms, and you needed a four-digit code to access this next door to get through to the next room. Um, there was about six of us in there, and half of them were part of the security team, and the other half we were kind of developers and some of the admin people. And we managed to crack the first part of the code. Excellent, fantastic. We had the first two numbers. So we then decided, well, let's split up. Me and some of the other people will look, you know, can we find the last two answers? That would be amazing. And the security team just worked out, well, there's only possibly 100 combinations, and I can try one a second, so I'll just start trying the rest of the combinations to get out of the room. It was the number 15. We escaped really quite quickly, at which point the person running the escape room was like, how did you get out so fast? <laughs> well, we'd like to say we're really clever, but in reality, you made a mistake by just allowing us to brute force your system. Don't trust the users, that, don't trust that they will do what you expect them to, because they will always do the unexpected. So we then look at, with broken access control, another one is broken authentication. Now there's a whole ba bunch of areas this particular thing can be broken. Authentication is a thing that has been in websites for a long, long time. The first sort of broken authentication mechanisms in, web mechanisms in websites were when people were storing user ID equals one in a cookie, and then sending that back to the browser. That was the early days of the internet. That was what was happening. So anyone who knew how to change the value to one, which was probably the admin in your system, could now log into your system. But it still goes on to this day and age. The, who's heard of the Nissan Leaf, an electric car? Do you know it has an app and an API you can talk to? You app on your phone, you can control, turn the heating on, see how many miles are left on your charge, see the charge status, that kind of thing. Um, a researcher had a Nissan Leaf, started looking, through, again, monitoring the API requests that were being sent to the back end, and then realized that, well, the, the thing that's identifying that I can access my particular car is the vehicle identification number. That's the only thing that was authenticating them. And the vehicle identification number is printed on the window of the car. So there's no verification that the person sending those requests to the API owns that vehicle that is maybe being sat in by someone right now. You're on a very hot summer's day and your air conditioning turns off and you start sweating, you turn it back on, it turns itself back off. There's no, someone else is controlling this potentially. So again, this is, <laughs> an authentication has been around for a long, long time, but it's still having the same mistakes made. Again, powered by the curiosity of, huh, I wonder what's actually being sent there. And that sort of clever solution of, oh, I can see there that there's not actually any authentication details going on. So the big one that kind of keeps coming up is hashing passwords. Gone are the days of using MD5, because that was never a good idea. We've got things like bcrypt, argon. These are hashing mechanisms designed to be 
secure. There's you know, competitions and challenges set out there to make sure these things are much more secure. And there's no excuse to not be using them. Which is great, because you might be hashing your passwords amazingly in your website. The problem is that users are reusing those passwords on other websites that are not as good as you, for example. There was a study run in 2018 by LastPass and LogMeIn. They surveyed 2,000 people, and 60% of them were reusing password across passwords across accounts. And of those people, over 60% were reusing passwords across personal and work accounts. Which then means that if a site gets breached, you don't even have to worry about trying to brute force a password. It's just find the password in a breach, see if the user's in your system, and try one of the list. Chances are they're reusing them. So you can be doing everything you can. You can be hashing these passwords properly, storing them in a really secure way, not you know, locking everything down, and the users will still find a way to just reuse a password that was on a really bad site, and now someone has got access to their account. It's called credential stuffing, and it's an increasing threat nowadays. Who's heard of the website haveibeenpwned.com? If you haven't, go there, put your email in, see how many breaches you've been in. I've been in a lot. So each one of those breaches has potentially leaked my password out to the world. Now, the idea, ideal world is you know, unique password for every website, which is the case, so you know, it's not a problem. It's run by a guy called Troy Hunt, and this is kind of his thing. There are billions and billions of records in here now that you can search your email address and get back. What breaches were you in? Adobe, LinkedIn, MySpace, Yahoo, all of those things. Even down to some of the smaller ones and smaller forums. So we said about don't reuse passwords, but users will try and do so based on some of the studies. There are ways to stop your users reusing passwords. You don't want them to reuse a password. If they've put in a vulnerable password that come from a website that has been breached, we don't want to allow that. Who can tell me what this password is? Or how might we crack it? There's tools out there like John the Ripper or Hashcat. We can start you know, working our way through these hashes. Alternatively, we could just Google it and see how many results come up. That's the MD5 hash of the word password, which is really a lot more common than you might think. So with this, as part of the Have I Been Pwned website, there's the Pwned Passwords API, where you can send off the first few characters of a hash of a password to the back end, to this API, and it will send you back a list of all the passwords that might match that hash with the number of times they have been found in breaches, which then means you can then do a search of, right, okay, which of the passwords is in there, and report back to the user to say, I'm sorry, this password has been breached in another website, we don't recommend that you use it, or we don't allow you to use it. Which is quite a cool idea. It's been used in some very large websites, um, the game EVE Online put this thing in place and then started collecting some really interesting stats on how many users were logging in or trying to register with breached passwords. It's a really nice thing to look at as a, you know what, if, they, if someone is breached in another website, I'm not going to allow that to affect me. And alongside this, we can use multi-factor authentication. So again, it's, you know, if we're looking at credential stuffing as a way of, well, actually, if they just get someone else's password from another breach and throw it into the application, how can we make sure that they can't keep just you know, getting into accounts. Multi-factor authentication is not necessarily a new thing, and even non-technical people use it. So single-factor authentication is your username and your password. There might be two pieces of information, but they are only things that are known to you. That's a single factor. Multi-factor states that it's something you know, something you have, a physical item, a access key, and then potentially something you are, a fingerprint, iris, you know, the biometric data. Who here has used chip and pin before? Pay with your card, enter your pin, or you go to an ATM to withdraw money, you put your card in, enter a pin. It's multi-factor authentication, because it's something you have, the physical card, and something you know, which is your pin. So it's not a new concept, it's just people get kind of scared when they hear these you know, 2FA and MFA, and it all sounds a little bit weird. In reality, it's something that a lot of people are doing without even realizing it. So this sort of thing means now that if you've got two-factor authentication apps, um, for your website where you know, there's time-based codes and things. Even if someone gets your password, it cannot be used to log into account. But don't use SMS for it. One of the increasing ways is that people hijack your SIM, so they phone up a telco and say, hey, can I change my, SIM, my phone number to another SIM? And then they manage to convince the telco to do that, and now they've got control of your phone number, which means now they can receive your two-factor authentication codes and 
do some nasty things. So it's kind of, we're now not even trusting users. We're not trusting data, we're not trusting users, we're not trusting where we store our data. What about packages in our application? So many applications these days aren't written from scratch with everything by yourself, it's just not worth it. it doesn't, the world doesn't work like that anymore. So it's a case of well, what packages in your application do you trust? Every major language has a package manager of some sort that says, hey, I can go and fetch that package from that person, pull it into my application, and start using their code. Which now means you've got this other web of support of, well, how far out does that stretch if this package relies on that package, relies on that package? But we've got tools to deal with this now. GitHub introduced automated checkers to search your project dependencies. What packages of these packages do I know have vulnerabilities within them? And this is something that can just work. It doesn't even require a lot of work to get set up. It just does it. More, more languages are getting involved, and more languages are getting added to support for this. But it's a really nice way to say, well, actually, I've got these vulnerabilities in my application because you know, this package, package A, has got a known vulnerability in it, and I'm relying on that particular version. You've probably got more packages than you think as well, because it's not even just necessarily your Node app or your PHP app or your Java app or whatever it might be. Again, you've got your front end with all your front end dependencies pulled in probably through Node and compiled with something like Webpack. You know, you've got a lot of dependencies there. Mobile apps, if you're using Android, iOS, there's ways to pull in packages from those as well. Then you've got your back end in whatever language that might be written in. Then you've got your platform or your OS and then your infrastructure. Are you managing your infrastructure with something like Terraform? There may be vulnerabilities in that that allow, you know, that allow it to do things that you might not expect. Again, you've got to consider it at all levels because there's a huge sort of web of trust that you've got with all of these things. So a good idea is you know, keep them up to date. Don't just install it and go, ah, it's sitting there working. Keep it up to date, keep an eye on it, monitor it, and keep looking at what's going on. In reality, you have a lot more surface area than you might think which can seem really scary, because suddenly you're like, oh, I don't even just have to check my front end, I have to check my back end, I have to check where my code is hosted, I have to check that there's no public secrets in my repository, I have to make sure that my developers don't have 24-7 access to production so they you know, can't have their laptop stolen at a conference and have someone access the data. I need to consider, okay, what are the users inputting? There's, all, you know, there's a whole world of things to do, which is why making it a mindset of everyone at every stage of the project is just a good way to go about it. It's not necessarily about after the fact, going, right, now let's secure our system. That's too late. It's not about considering it as an afterthought. Make it a part of the project from the start, which a lot of the time is very difficult because projects aren't just you know, sprung up out of nowhere every week a lot of the time. There are legacy systems out there. So you do have to go in and retroactively add them. So the best way to do this is to kind of look at, okay, next time you start a new feature or you, put a, you, know, you go for a bug fix in your system, what conditions could you check to make sure that it can't be used in a malicious way? Just start thinking about that. You're not going to get everything. There is no magic solution. Security is not an absolute. It's not a con you know, no system is 100% secure. But by starting to make these things that developers think about, we can make sure that that curiosity of the people looking at the system that are constantly there going, how can I get into that? I've got this wall. I can't see over it. I can't see around it. What things can I start looking at to get through it? That, that just yields less and less results. The reason being is that, who's heard of the phrase death by a thousand paper cuts? It's the idea that it's come to mean something that's a slow process. It's not, you know, you're beheaded and then it's over. It's the idea that a lot of small failures, a lot of small openings here and there end up in the demise of a system. It's not that they find one exposed database necessarily. It's that there's one exploit and another and another. And before they know it, they've built up a much larger picture of what's going on. So if we can reduce that, it makes it a lot, more, lot harder. Again, I'm really sorry there's no magic solution. It requires work. It requires diligence. It requires you to co sort of consider it on a new level of, I'm not just writing software. I'm not just doing this thing. I'm consider considering what sort of impact it will have if this data got breached. Mistakes are going to happen. It will go wrong. It's OK. It, terrible things happen, but there's nothing you can do. But if you, say, if you can say you've tried your best, that's a start. That's the best thing anyone can ask. 
Again, I'm really sorry. Hacking is not like the movies. It doesn't work like this. You don't sit in a room. Mostly this is sort of a consideration of what other things that developers are still doing. It's 2019 and there's a lot of things that are still going wrong. And it's the basics. So it might sound a bit odd to have to stand up here and say, you know, escape your, in you know, es uh, escape your input and output and make sure it's sanitized and use prepared statements. But these are things that are still going on in 2019. So we kind of need to evaluate, who do you trust with that data? Be it your code, your data in your databases, customer data, whatever it might be. You need to consider that you want security at all stages of your project. It's not an afterthought. Consider the principle of least privilege and who has access to what. Do they really need it? You want to encrypt your data in transit and at rest, make sure that if the data is there, it's not easily accessed. Check your public websites for secrets, because they can leak out. Be that in Git or on your website. Don't trust your users and don't trust input. That's the biggest mistake. Make sure you hash your passwords properly and don't let people reuse passwords, for example. Look at your components in your application from the full stack. What, what ones are there? Just make sure they're not vulnerable. The OWASP top 10 is a great place to go and look for this. This is a I've covered some of the areas of the top 10, but there's a lot more in there. And the OWASP top 10 is kind of one of those, if these are the mistakes that are still being made, and these are the top 10, if you address these things, then that's sort of the biggest impact you can have with you know, the effort you might, you might be able to put in for this. And wh whenever you're building something, you've got to consider the mindset of a hacker and you know, always be curious. What happens if... What happens if I change that value? What happens if I click this button that you just assume that people wouldn't click? What happens if I go into the inspector and change the form value that's hidden, but it's secure because it's hidden, right? What happens if you do that sort of thing? So yes, please rate the session afterwards and whatever sessions you go to for the rest of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>